morning and welcome to worship. I'm Pastor Michelle. We're so glad that you have joined us today. If you're new with us during the pandemic, we're so glad that you're here and extend a special welcome to you. If you'll text new to the number that you see on your screen, we have an ebook that we'd like to send you, something that we think will be helpful for you during this time. If you worship with us regularly, we're glad that you're here, and we hope that you'll let us know. You can do that by going to the online worship tab on our website, or follow the QR code that's on your screen. There's a place there also to let us know if you have specific prayer requests that we can pray for during the week. This is a great time, if you're not currently in a small group, to join a new small group that'll be starting in June. There are several starting. There's information on our website about what the groups are. There's a form that you can fill out to let us know what you're interested in, and we'll get back to you. We would love to connect you in that way. There are also several opportunities right now for you to be helpful in the community. One of those is Feeding It Forward. Beginning June 9th, we will resume our regular every other Tuesday night, uh, providing dinner at Bridge to Home. The other is a new opportunity to us. It's for you to assemble welcome kits to be used by LASA for families who are experiencing homelessness. There's information on our website about that as well. We're so glad that you have joined us today. Welcome to worship. Here in this place, new light is streaming. Now is the darkness vanished away. See in this space our fears and our dreamings. Brought here to you in the light of this day. Gather us in the lost and forsaken. Gather us in the blind and the lame. Call to us now and we shall awaken. We shall arise at the sound of our Nicole Riley. I'm the lead and teaching pastor here. And today is Pentecost. It is the birthday of the church. Uh, when the church started, it started in homes. It started in the corner of the market. It started in the courtyard. So when we talk about the birthday of the church, we're not talking about a building. We're talking about a people. This is an important word for us, especially today as we celebrate Pentecost. Because I think in these last um, months, we've had to look at what it means to be the church in maybe a different way. We've had to think about what matters. Is it connection? Is it... Um, care? Is it 
reaching out to one another or is it gathering all together in a building on Sunday? Not that there's anything the matter with buildings. Buildings are helpful to us, but they are not the body of Christ. We, the people, are the body of Christ. Curiously, throughout time, when the church has not been able to gather together, uh, people have found their faith growing. They have found that as they meet in their homes, as they put their faith together the best that they can, that when they're able to come back together, that their faith is increased and that they appreciate not only their faith, but their connection to others. We know that there will come a time when we are able to regather. And so I do want you to know that we are working on that plan now. So we've been working on that for a while, waiting for direction from the state on specifics. And we've been meeting, a group of us from the lead team have been meeting to work on specifics for this. For us to put a plan together, it is of course a little more complicated than we'd like. Uh, I think many of us would just like to be able to get back together on Sunday, but uh, for us to put a plan together to keep everyone safe and to do the best that we can in this time, we have a plan, a people who will put it together, best practices that we'll be working on to move forward with it, and then we will need to get it okayed by our bishop and district superintendent. This is an important piece for us because as United Methodist Church, we'll be looking to our bishop and district superintendent to give us the green light once they see our plan and make sure we have everything in order ready to go. You will be getting regular communication from us as we put our plan together. So if you are not receiving the e-blast, um, there's a QR code on your screen that will let you sign up for it. This will keep you uh, up to date on our plan as we regather. The church matters. Jesus gave his life to begin the church. And Jesus claims us and he calls us and he desires us to be his people. Church matters, especially now. But church isn't a building. Church is a people. So I invite you in this time between where we are now and where we will be next to make sure that you're connected to the church to its people, to be in a small group, to attend our social hour, which happens after um, when our services are premiered, so at 10 a.m. on Sunday on Zoom, to connect to what's going on uh, on Facebook or on Instagram, and to reach out, to talk to other people, to connect as the church. Jesus loves the church, and he calls us to give our best so that it would flourish. That's why so many of you have stepped up. That's why our staff and our leadership have gone the extra mile in this time. The church matters, and today, Pentecost is one of those days where we really get to celebrate the church and the gift that it is to us all. So welcome to worship. Welcome to Pentecost. We are the Smith Parker family. And we are the church. We, we are, are here, here for good. good. We are the Rosales family and we are the church. And, and we, we are, are here, here for good. Hi, I'm Lori Wilson. I am the church, and we are here for good. Hi there, we are Denise and Doug Spiker, and we, we are, are the church. church. We are here, here for, for good. good. We are the Wirtz family, and we are the church. And we're here for good. We, we are, are the, the Barber, Barber family, family and, and we, we are, are the church. church. We are here for good. Hi, 
I'm Lisa Basher, and we are the church. We are here for good. Hi, I'm Stuart Thompson. I'm Lenita Thompson. And I'm Sammy Seneff. We, we are, are the, the church, church, and we, we are, are here, here for good. good. We are the Cunningham family. We are the church. We, we are, are here, here for good. good. Will you join me now in a time of prayer? Let us pray. Holy and loving God, as we enter into this season of Pentecost, we are grateful for the gift of the Holy Spirit and for the work of the Spirit in our lives. We are grateful for your work in the world through the church and through us, your people. Our faith calls us to continually make choices and decisions about the ways that we will trust and follow you. We thank you for your continued presence with us, for your continued promise of meeting us where we are. We pray especially for those, um, for our confirmation class, and for all others who are making that decision of faith. We're grateful, God, that you meet us in those places, and that you call us always to come closer and to go deeper into our faith. Today, God, we pray for all who live under oppression and racism. Remind us that all people are created in your image, that all people have worth and value. Help us to be your people who affirm and encourage and value and love all others. We continue to pray for the world as we face this pandemic. We pray for those who are ill and for those who are caring for them. We pray for doctors and scientists who are working to make a difference. We pray for leaders politically and in the government and church leaders who are making decisions about how we can safely regather. And we pray in all of that, God, that your wisdom and your spirit would lead us. We lift to you those who are on our hearts, for those who are ill, for those who are grieving, for those who are feeling especially lonely or isolated or overwhelmed. We are grateful, God, that you are good and that your love never ends and that you are with us in each moment. May we be your people who live that out in all of the ways that we can. We pray this in the name of your Son. Amen.
day Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like a blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on, that, on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now, they were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. When they heard the sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one heard their own language being spoken. Utterly amazed, they asked, aren't these who are speaking Galileans? Then how is it that each of us hears them in our own native languages? Then Peter stood up with the 11, raised his voice and addressed the crowd. Fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These people are not drunk, as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. No, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days and they will prophesy. I will show wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. So it is Pentecost. Are you wearing your red? Your red pajamas? Whatever you got going over there? Well, no, it's a season, so if you forgot the red today, you can just wear it in the next couple weeks. Uh, red is the official color of Pentecost. Um, as we heard the scripture read at the beginning of our time together from the children, it's because of the flame and the uh, Holy Spirit power and fire that was upon each of their heads. Uh, that is the color of red, and that is the story um, of Pentecost, of this redness. So I hope that you are wearing red today and enjoying the festival color. I, I want to start off by talking a little bit about Pentecost itself and uh, giving you a sense of a little bit of the history of it. Um, Pentecost is, of course, the birthday of the church. It's when the church started. But Pentecost has a longer history than that, actually. Uh, a little bit of a richer history of that, too. So Pentecost is a Jewish festival. It's known by a couple names. It's called either the Festival or the Feast of the Weeks or Pentecost. Uh, the title Feast of the Weeks or Festival of the Weeks refers to um, the number of weeks that happens between Passover and Pentecost. Um, the word Pentecost, though, refers to the number of days. So one title refers to the number of weeks, another refers to the number of days. But basically, it's, it refers to a period of time um, from Passover, which for us is around Easter time, and then to this day, which is about 50 days or seven weeks, depending on the year, how it falls. The festival of Pentecost itself was a, a festival that was a celebration, and there were two parts to it. It was a harvest festival, and so farmers would have been bringing in their harvest um, from the hillside into Jerusalem to give a, an offering, a first fruits offering at the temple. It was also a time where they remembered uh, the giving of the Ten Commandments, so this was an important focus with Moses and the Israelites on Mount Sinai uh, receiving the Ten Commandments. This was a, a celebration at Pentecost of the Ten Commandments. So this would have been a holiday. This would have been a feast day. This would have been um, everybody coming into Jerusalem to be together and to celebrate this festival. That's why the text starts off with the line, when the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. They were all together in one place because they were having family celebrations. So they had gathered together, and, and if you want to use your imagination a little bit, think about here are these followers of Jesus who have also come into Jerusalem. 
Uh, earliest followers of Jesus are Jewish, and so they are coming to celebrate Pentecost as they knew it, and they come into Jerusalem. They've already experienced uh, Jesus' death and resurrection, and then they had heard from Jesus before his ascension that there would come a moment when the Holy Spirit, the power of God, would be coming upon them. And so here they are together at Pentecost, and that's where it happens in this surprising and unusual way. The text says this. Suddenly a sound like a blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. There's a lot going on in today's text. So we're gonna look at just two things. We're gonna talk about the Holy Spirit, and then we're gonna look at what Pentecost meant for those first followers of Jesus, and what it means for us now too. So the first big idea this morning is around the Holy Spirit, and it's this. The Holy Spirit's arrival is what starts the church. Now, this is an important thing to get because this is often a minor festival for us, right? Pentecost, it's it's not Easter, you know, it's not Christmas, but it's actually quite a big deal. It is the day when God starts the church, and that's important for us to give our attention to. Now, what happened on Pentecost that made it possible for all of this to start? Well, On Pentecost, what God's Spirit did was come upon the people in such a way that those who were followers of Jesus but had so many doubts and questions and such uncertainty, all of a sudden, they got it. They had their aha moment in their faith. They got that Jesus Christ was Lord and that this had fundamentally changed everything in the world for them. The Spirit was now with them. The Spirit was now giving them all that they needed, all that they had lacked before, giving them all that they needed so that they might be the people of God, this brand new people of God. They'd been transformed, and this is the reason why this is how the church starts, with this transformation, this this new thing that God is doing. God had changed them. He had turned them from a, I don't know, maybe a ragtag group of people, um, just every day and below every day kind of people, and he had transformed them into his people, into his church. Pentecost was a pivot in Christian history. Uh, Most of the stories we're familiar with about the church happened during Jesus' life when the disciples are there and all of their fumbling and bumbling. But here we have this pivot, this moment in history where things become so much more clear. I want to share a couple of those things. What became more clear? What really changed for these first followers of Jesus on Pentecost? So the first thing is they knew the way. So before this, the followers of Jesus were saying things like, when is our um, God going to send a conquering army of angels to drive out our enemies? They were always waiting for those kinds of things and pushing Jesus on that. And now what they get is what Jesus was about. And he wasn't about conquering. He was about love. He was about a, a way of ministry that was getting real with people and living in the midst of them and treating people, all people, as equal and beloved of God. They now knew the way. This was the way of Jesus, and now they heard it clearly. Second, they knew the truth. They knew who Jesus was deep within themselves, They knew that God had sent Jesus to start 
this new way, and that the Spirit now was with them and would give them what they needed to do this work. I mean, remember, these are just a bunch of regular people, but God's Spirit upon them enabled them to know this truth, the truth of who they were, who God was, and what the call was. They knew the truth of God's power and glory upon them, and as that unfolded, so did how they lived and how they moved this new movement forward in the world. Next, they knew power. I like this one myself because I think that many times as people of faith, we don't live very powerful lives. If we look at the lives of many of the earliest followers of Jesus, they, they were not very powerful people. But in this moment, in this time of Pentecost, they knew power, not their own, but the power of God, the power of God that came upon them, the power of God that changed them from just operating on what they knew to trusting what God was doing. Then the last one I want to bring up is they knew community. I think we really see this in the text when it talks about how they spoke in different languages. This is about uh, the breaking down of barriers between people, uh, language barriers. But as the church has grown, we've seen it as talking about barriers between us in all kinds of ways, uh, cultural barriers, economic barriers, um, age barriers, race barriers, uh, gender and gender orientation barriers, whatever it is, uh, political uh, things, whatever it is that divides us. This is saying, you are all one. You are all my people. You are siblings of one another. We are invited into this community. Pentecost changed these early followers of Jesus. They knew the way. They knew the truth. They knew power. And they knew community. Pentecost changed everything everything for them. Without Pentecost, there'd be no church because there'd be no power of God operating through everyday people. It changed everything for them, and I think it still changes everything for us today. What God has done for us in Jesus Christ, in his life, in his death, in his resurrection. What God has done for us in sending the Spirit, his Spirit among us and within us, all of these things call us now as his body, his church, to be about the way of transformation in the world. Because of what God has done for us, we are called to live into this power as the church living into this power in the world. That, of course, is a challenge, right? Uh, now we are uh, all in our own houses during this time, and it, it feels maybe little like we're less the church because we're on our own, but I don't think it has to be that way at all. I think wherever you are, on your own or with others, you are the church. You are the power of Pentecost. This is how early Christians experienced this power in their life. This is Romans 8, 14 through 17. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. For you did not receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received a spirit of adoption. When we cry, Abba, Father, it is with that very spirit bearing witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. If, in fact, we suffer with him so that we may also be glorified with him. This text is saying to us, that we are God's children. We are 
God's people. We no longer need to be people who live in fear, people who are filled with anger and uncertainty and doubt. We are no longer slaves. We are God's beloved. This is a huge difference, and this is about the power of God in our lives. Now, what does all this say to us today? I think, you know, so much of the main things um, that it says to us are the things it said to those first Christians. I think a lot of us haven't lived into the power of Pentecost. You know, it's, it's so much about what God wants to do in us and then through us for the world. Here's a couple things you might try to take those next steps to live into the promise of Pentecost. The first is this. Recommit to being the church. I mean, really, like, even though you're in your home and uh, or you're in your car watching or wherever you are today, recommit to being the church and all that that means in today's world. It doesn't only mean gathering on Sunday. It, it means gathering throughout the week, connecting to a group, being part of a small group. We are all called to be in community. It's not optional. You know, like sometimes people will say, well, church is kind of optional. I'm a Christian. I follow Jesus, but I haven't really found a church I like. Jesus calls us to be in his church, which isn't just Sunday. It means to be in a community of believers, people that we live our lives with. If you've never been in a small group before, you may not know the power of this and what this can do for your life, how it helps you to be known and to grow in your faith. I really want to encourage you to recommit to the, being the church and to recommit to being the church by being in a small group, being in Christian community with people. Second, I want to invite you to pray for those of us who are making these choices as we look to regather. We do not know when we will regather. So much of that will depend on um, how things continue to unfold and um, the guidance we get from, from our bishop on this. But all of these pieces are a lot. And those of us who are working on this, we would really appreciate your prayers so that we, we make decisions based um, in wisdom and not based in um, all the other things that would distract us and, and stop us from really doing the best we can in this time. Um, we are called to um, grow in our trust in this time and growing in our trust of, of one another and what it means to be the church, part of that's going to be what it looks like to be regathering. And so we'd appreciate your prayers in that time. And then the third thing I want to encourage you to do today is to pray for those who are being confirmed. Um, this is usually Confirmation Sunday. And this is usually the Sunday where we confirm young people who have come to the faith and want to be part of the church. It's that transition between being a child and claiming the faith for yourself as an adult. And so we will have confirmation when we can regather in the fall. But pray for those who will be confirmed that this time, which may have tested their faith, will also help them perfect and to grow in their faith. Today is Pentecost, and we are reminded that the Spirit's power lives and moves in the church in whatever way that looks today. So know that this is Pentecost, and you Wherever you are, you are the church. Let us pray. Loving and holy God, we give thanks. 
for all that you've already done in our lives and all that you will yet do. We are grateful for Pentecost and for the giving of your spirit to each and every one of us so that we might live not lives of slavery and fear, but lives where we are your beloved and live into what it means to be your children. In a time like this, we need your strength more than ever, so help us not to lean to our own understanding, but to lean to your understanding and what you would have us do that is best, best in your sight. Be with us, show us the way, and help us to be faithful to all that you've given us, including the gift of your church. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm Steve Stebbins, and I serve on the lead team here at the church. I want to thank you for your generosity, which is enabling the church to continue to be active and engaging. You will see on your screen a QR code that will take you to the online giving link. There are also other ways that you can give 
which will enable the church to continue to do what God has called us to do. Thank you and bless you. So this is a different kind of Pentecost, isn't it? But in some ways, I think it's one of the best Pentecosts ever. Because we really each look to ourselves and no, I guess I'm the church. Till we all can gather together and we can lean into each other, we recognize I am the church. I am where God's spirit is living and God is calling me no matter how long I've been a Christian, no matter how many times I stumble, God is calling me to be his church. So may you feel empowered to be his church in your own unique way. May you know that God goes with you. And may you go from this time to love and to serve the Lord and one another. Go be his church. Amen. <laughs>